Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from Central Maine is my friend Brian Swartz. Brian, good morning. Good morning, Chris. How are you today? Doing great. How about yourself? I can't complain. Very good. I just want to, um, before we were chatting, you were telling me the weather, and I just want to get you to say the word wicked in conversation. So what's the, uh, what was the humidity like the other day? Last Friday, the humidity here in Maine was wicked. See, look at that. There we go. Now I know I'm talking to a real Mainer because I, you know. <laughs> Brian is the author of the brand new Emerging Civil War series biography, Passing Through the Fire, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain in the American Civil War. Uh, congratulations on the new book. Thank you very much. So now... Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain seems like an obvious target because so many people know him, but you actually have a, a fairly personal connection to the Chamberlain story. Tell me about that. Chamberlain and I both grew up in Brewer, Maine. It was a small town in, in uh, the early 19th century, and it remains a small city today and probably always will be. He uh, grew up at what we called 80 Chamberlain Street. The house is still there. There's a little marker on it to, that connects to the Chamberlain significance. But my grandparents in the 1940s purchased an old farm up at the far end of Chamberlain Street. So I grew up essentially at 272 Chamberlain Street. The uh, street was in existence by 1862. So it was not I mean, it was named for the Chamberlain family, but was not named specifically for Joshua Lawrence. I can put it that way. We have traveled some of the same terrain in Brewer. He mentions sledding on Holyoke Hill. It's a prominent little hill on uh, North Main Street in Brewer. He mentions in one of his accounts of standing in the high ground, Bangor Brewer, and he can see the, the hills to the east there's a very distinctive horizon when you look east from Brewer or Bangor. And he names some of those hills. And if I go up on the high ground, I can see them and the names are still the same. There's a connection there. He played with his brothers and his sister on a brook that ran across the family farm. And that brook still existed in the 1960s when I was growing up. It, a baseball field was uh, built next to it. I don't understand why. <laughs> And every time there'd be a heavy rain, that would cancel the baseball game for a night or two until the, the brook receded. And unfortunately, the brook has vanished because the city converted it to a storm sewer, just because of that issue of the, the local land being flooded. And the, and the baseball field now, that which was part of the Chamberlain Farm, has become a housing development. Oh, geez. Most of the farm uh, probably has been developed into housing especially after World War II, when the city had a, an extensive population growth up through the mid-1950s. Mm, okay. Yep. So it's a, a much different landscape now than it was during uh, Chamberlain years as a boy, uh, but still you can walk in some of those same footsteps. You can walk in some of the same footsteps. The headland that he refers to was behind the house where he was born is still there. Uh, you cannot develop the headland because it just, it drops right off into the Penobscot River. Uh, Holyoke Hill is still there. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, the, the hills on the Eastern horizon are still there, but much of the rest of the Bangor Brewer has changed forever. And of course, Chamberlain uh, grew up, moved away, but the city of Brewer still commemorates him with a nice little park. You wanna kind of talk about that for a second? The, the city of Brewer, uh, specifically the Brewer Historical Society, when the main Department of Transportation planned to re, uh, demolish what we call the old bridge in the 1980s, I believe it was, and build a new modern highway connecting State Street and Brewer with Washington Street in Bangor, decided it wanted to put in a, a curve on Holyoke Hill, which involved cutting away part of the hill they actually tore down what was called the Christmas House. It was a building that Chamberlain may have been familiar with. It was actually at one time owned by my great aunt, great uncle. It was a house that was connected with the Underground Railroad, supposedly by a tunnel. But after tearing down the Christmas House and building the curve, the state left a 
half a hillside, I guess you would call it. The Brewer Historical Society lobbied the city and the state to establish the Chamberlain Freedom Park. And that has stood for going on, I would say almost 30 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, features in a statue of uh, Chamberlain standing on a boulder. The idea being it portrays him as he would have in those moments before the Alabamians made contact with the 20th Maine Infantry's right flank at Little Round Top, his arms folded, he's staring sternly into the distance as if he could see or hear the Alabamians coming. Uh, the, uh, it also features an American flag. There's a scale monument of the 20th Maine Infantry mirroring their uh, Little Round Top monument. But down below at the, at the curve of North Main Street and State Street is Maine's Underground Railroad Monuments, which features an escaped slave climbing out of a hole or out of a tunnel. And that tunnel, uh, that particular monument was the site of the state's first Juneteenth celebration here just uh, several weeks ago. Oh, wow, fantastic. The, it's, a, uh, it's a neat little park. Uh, it's one of the things, park, yeah. One of the things I really like about your book is, is there's an appendix that talks about different Chamberlain related places to visit in the state. Yes. For folks who want to come up and visit. Where are some other spots that folks can go? Uh, Brunswick's a great place to go. It is the heart of Chamberlain lore in the state, thanks to his basically almost lifetime affiliation with Bowdoin College. The uh, Pajeb Scott History Center is a great place to visit. The center owns Joshua Chamberlain's house and operates it as a museum. The, uh, it's usually a docent or two available to take people on tours. It's a, a little gift shop uh, there at the museum in which we'll be carrying, passing through the fire, by the way. There's the family's grave site in the cemetery behind Bowdoin College. It's a monument of Chamberlain at the edge of the Bowdoin uh, campus. The church where he married Fanny still stands diagonally across from his statue. And if you walk the street that goes past the Pajep Scott History Center's uh, museum, you have a sense that you could be walking in the footsteps of Joshua Chamberlain. And several of those homes date to his era. In Portland, there's the old federal building downtown. In Freeport, in case you're going to visit L.L. Bean, uh, about a block or two south from the main building, there's Town Park, and the town Civil War statue was there. And Chamberlain gave the dedication speech when the uh, monument was unveiled to the public in the late 19th century. Here in Bangor and Brewer, there's the Bangor Theological Seminary campus where he studied, I believe it was three years to become a minister. It was a job his mother wanted him to pursue and he turned out he had no desire in it. There's the Chamberlain Freedom Park at the Bangor Historical Society Museum on Union Street. You can see the sword that he wore at Little Round Top. The, you can't hold it, but you can see it. You can, it's a pretty good ding that that Confederate bullet put it into it and when it knocked him down. Uh, it's very impressive to see that sword and realize yeah, Chamberlain was wearing it and he must have brought it home I perhaps gave it to his parents, I'm not sure, or at least somehow it, it, it wound up at the Bangor Historical Society sometime later. I'm not now, sure have, how it got have there. Have they ever given you the white gloves and let you hold it? I've never asked. Okay, okay. They might, but um, I just sort of- You had a look on your face like, oh boy, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, perhaps someday, someday. <laughs> So with, with Chamberlain being such a fixture, of course, there's the, the Joshua Chamberlain Bridge that connects Bangor and Burr, which is how yes. I first heard his name uh, years and years ago. Um, so with so much Chamberlain in the States, um, why do you find him such a compelling figure when, when some people might argue, gosh, he's, he's actually overexposed? I find him to be a compelling figure because like me, he's he is what is called a brewer boy. It's a local anachronism, anachronism excuse me, that uh, applies to young men, I guess, who've grown up in brewer. That's the only claim to fame some of us have, I guess. But for me, it's the, 
not so much as heroism, but his refusal to quit, no matter what condition he was suffering, malaria, the wound at Petersburg, he just kept going, not only during the war, but afterwards for the rest of his life. He seemed to be a man, I can't say that was almost driven, but he seemed to be seeking a higher purpose in life other than just the accolades of a Bowdoin College president or a four-term Maine governor. He tried to become senator, but was stopped by James G. Blaine, who controlled the Republican Party in Maine. But for me, there is a sense of both, again, heroism and a drive to serve his country. Mm -hmm. I come from a long line of military personnel. Even my mother was a Coast Guard veteran. She was, I mean, a World War II veteran. She was a Coast Guard veteran during the uh, war, uh, World War II. My dad was a combat veteran from World War II in Korea. My brother commanded the Allied uh, Engineering Brigade in Afghanistan in 2006. So our family has always had people who serve the country. Chamberlain, when given a legitimate reason just to call it quits, refused to stop serving. And there's something about that that really appeals to me. When you mentioned his, his um, political conflict with James Blaine, and you know, I think that's a great example of how you know, Blaine was, was absolutely a, a political animal and, and Chamberlain's sense of principle clashed with that. Um, and, and, you know, Blaine really wanted someone he could control. And, and that's one reason why he, he opposed Chamberlain so much because he knew that Chamberlain would stand by principle, not by party. Mm -hmm. Blaine was considered a hero here in Maine in the latter 19th century uh, until the day he died. And of course, the state purchased his uh, house on State Street in Augusta and became Blaine House is where the Governor Mills is, lives right now. Blaine, in my research, comes across, as you mentioned, a political animal driven uh, for the sake of power. Right. He was a puppet master pulling the puppet strings, what do you want to call it? And Chamberlain refused to bow down to him to kiss his proverbial ring. And so when Chamberlain sought to become a senator after four terms as governor, Blaine stopped it. I sensed that there was a little bit of payback during that January 1880 armed rebellion and at the state house. As I, I was mentioning this uh, aspect of Chamberlain's life while speaking on Saturday, you know, we look at January 6, 2021 as an insurrection, but the armed rebellion in the, the main state house in January 1880, that was an insurrection. It had men from both political factions carrying arms, knives, and whatever else into the state house and basically occupying it. Chamberlain is called in as the commander of Maine's militia and basically with the aid of the Augusta City Police, he ultimately throws all of the armed men out of the state house. And of course, this, the main Supreme Court resolves the issue of who's the legitimately elected governor of the state of Maine. But James G. Blaine is one of the uh, politicians who's collecting an armed mob at his house just basically one block over from the state house and threatening to come in and occupy it possibly at bayonet point. And Chamberlain just basically tells him, get lost. I don't know if he used any richer language than that, but he <laughs> let Blaine know that I don't want to see you or your people here at least carrying guns. And that, that comes across in the, in the articles. Uh, I, I think there was an issue of payback there on Chamberlain's part. He could have had Blaine arrested if he showed up, you know, carrying a pistol into the state house. Let's put it that way. And I'll point people back to the Emerging Civil War blog because you wrote a, a really great piece about that insurrection and Chamberlain's role in it. And 
kind of how he found himself as uh, uh, unexpectedly in charge of the state while they're resolving all that and trying to quell this uh, this strange little rebellion. So great piece. Thank you. Uh, let me circle back to a second to this this notion of perseverance that you've talked about with him. How would you apply that to his relationship with Fanny, his wife, which was a pretty troubled relationship at times? His perseverance damaged his relationship with Fanny. Now, she sent her husband off to war in July, August, 1862. And through the fall and winter, into the spring 1863, his letters are upbeat, informative, he's healthy, but somewhere before Gettysburg, he contracts malaria, I mean, Ellis Spear did too, they both were sick at Little Round Top. Shamon survives Little Round Top, he's become a hero. It obviously the praise and accolades he received from other officers, especially generals, immediately after the Battle of Gettysburg, made him feel good about himself. Whether it stoked an ego, I cannot quite tell. But as time passed, particularly when he was sick of malaria, and then after he's so seriously wounded with that uh, groin shot in Petersburg, he should have stayed home. Fanny obviously is caring for him when he arrives in Brunswick. He's incontinent. He's probably impotent. He's still seeping urine from the wrong places at times. So she's very much involved in his care, but he's home. He's alive. He has, what do they call it? The million dollar wound, mm -hmm. I think is the phrase, Some, something to that effect. He can stay home for good. She wants him home. She wants her husband. She wants him alive. But his drive to return to duty, and by February 1865, you can see the, the drive to perhaps uh, become commander of the 1st Division, the 5th Corps, that's in one of his letters, it creates a rift between the two of them. He's badly wounded, but yet he's going back. His parents are very upset. I mentioned that in the book about the, the winter 1865 correspondence with Joshua, who's been offered a very comfortable federal position in the city of Bath, about 10 miles from home. He refuses it, says, I'm going back to the war. And after the war, when Chamberlain finally retired from the army, instead of settling down with Fanny and the two children, he decided he accepts the uh, 1867 appointment by the uh, Republicans as the, the gubernatorial nominee and for four years returns to the Blaine House. She's so upset that she decides to stay in Brunswick with her children instead of moving to uh, Augusta with her husband. That says quite a bit about the relationship in the late 60s, very early 70s between Fanny and jo Joshua. They were estranged. And of course, there's been evidence suggested that he may at least at one time have been physically abusive with her. Mm -hmm. it's, but they worked it out. It's basically contained in a letter that he wrote her when she, or when he, I should say, learned that she was thinking about suing for divorce. But they stuck it out and resolved their differences and ultimately became each other's company in their fading years. The uh, ending decades of the Chamberlain couple, I find be very sad. They're both aging. Fanny had an eye disorder that led to her becoming blind. Joshua did start staying home more, but if he received an invitation to catch a train to a veterans reunion somewhere to speak, he'd catch the train. So often Fanny would have to travel down to their, I guess it's their daughter Grace's home in Eastern Massachusetts, stay with Grace and her husband and the three granddaughters. And um, it was a relationship that was close before the war, but whatever led to Joshua to develop his 
drive to excel, it strained their relationship for the rest of their lives. He never could quite give up that drive. It seems like he spent a considerable amount of time and effort in his post-war years sort of reliving his war years. You talk about him you know, taking these, these uh, invitations to veterans reunions and reunions and things like that. He wrote his account several times and, and gets more elaborate each time. Um, do you fault him for that though? No, I grew up in, in the, uh, during the Vietnam War actually reached uh, age 18 and could have been drafted in, in 1972. I knew many men who either enlisted or were drafted in the military. And one of them, his name was uh, Loring Watson. He lived diagonally across the street from my grandparents and we lived next to them. Uh, he was 19, enlisted in the Marine Corps and was killed up near Khe Sanh in 1969. The Vietnam War was a rite of passage for the men and women who served there. And for many, the Vietnam War was the defining moment of their lives. That was the way I, that I understand it was for Chamberlain and countless other Civil War veterans on both sides. They were young, well, Chamberlain's case, he was approaching middle age but it was the defining moment of their entire lives. Many adjusted afterwards, as did many Vietnam veterans, got on with their lives, but others remained looking into the past and Chamberlain was one. He had thrived on the camaraderie with his comrades. He writes Fanny from Maryland, I think it was in October, 1862, and I mentioned this letter in one of the early chapters that how much he is enjoying army life and that he cannot imagine ever going back to Bowdoin College and having to have a, a civilian superior telling him what to do and he, he would find academia stifling. Ironically, he will go back to Bowdoin and become its president, I think in 1871, because he and Fanny will need the regular income. But during the war, Chamberlain developed close relationships with other officers, some enlisted men. And there was that shared experience of combat, not just with the 20th Maine until he moved on to brigade command that in fall of 63, but with the first division, Rappahannock Station. Uh, he arrived back on, you know, in combat mid May. 1864 in the middle of the Spotsylvania courthouse battle and it, you know, stayed on until he was wounded, returned in November 1864 and participated on the, in the raid that tore up about 20 miles of the Weldon Railroad and then came home but went back again in late winter 1865 and stayed in not only until the uh, Grand Review but he tried to stay in the military as long as he could. And even at one point considered going on active duty, the War Department would have accepted his services, but he realized that with his wound, there was no way that he could probably survive, you know, re remote duty in some far Western outpost. Mm -hmm. He was not in any condition to ride a horse to chase the Sioux or Cheyenne all around Montana or Wyoming territory, that's for sure. So, and it strikes me too that, uh, you know, he spends all this time then reliving these, the glory days, as Bruce Springsteen would say. Um, but he also has the talent of a writer. I mean, he's a professor of rhetoric. So as he's reliving and, and recounting and, and uh, writing about it, I mean, he happens to have a writing talent that really makes his recollection stand out mm -hmm. among his peers which is something that is passed on to us and, and kind of one reason why I think he stands out as, as exemplary compared to many other people who had great service because he just had a writing talent that allowed him to stand out that way. Right. Chamberlain left Paper Trail, which enhanced my research. In fact, his Paper Trails nowadays lead to many doors and I've sent into a, a column uh, for a future post here about some of the doors in which I knocked figuratively and literally while researching Chamberlain. 
he drew, it seems, mostly upon his own memoirs. I know that as he aged, he was accused of embellishing much of what he did. Obviously, Holman Melcher, the lowly first lieutenant of Company F, who claimed that he started the charge at Little Round Top, uh, took issue with Chamberlain's claim that he ordered the charge uh, later on in the 1880s. Um, Melcher's account I find to be unbelievable because I cannot imagine that in the midst of a fight in which your regiment is about ready to be overrun, that you as a first lieutenant who is at the, the V, the fulcrum of the line, you're going to take some of your men out and charge down to rescue wounded comrades. That was Holman Melcher's first proposal. But later on in his memoirs, well, I think the book was written called With a Flash of His Sword. He basically takes claim for starting the charge. Well, the first lieutenant to do that, you're going to leave a hole in your line through which the Confederates can pour and they'll roll up both flanks and roll up the, the brigade. And that's the end of the left flank of the Union at Gettysburg. Ellis Spear took uh, claim, I should say supported Melcher's claim as the decades passed, especially into the early 20th century. But a point that is often overlooked that Spear wrote a letter to Maine soon after the battle I suspect it might have been during the one day pause the regiment had on July 6, 1863. The Portland Daily Press got the letter, ran a long extract on page one on the July 24th, 1863 issue. And in the letter, Spear eloquently describes what the regiment did at Little Round Top, describes how serious the situation was getting. And then he says, quote, the colonel ordered a charge, exclamation point, close quote, then goes on to explain how we charged, what we accomplished. So the, the claims of Melcher and Spear in later decades that, no, Chamberlain did not start the charge. It just either Melcher led it or it happened by itself. Uh, don't hold up you know, to the evidence closest to the actual event. And you know, the that relationship between Chamberlain and Spear sours over time. Yes, there's just some some bad blood between the two of them. It uh, it's sad to see it happen. Even up, I'd say late 1880s, the men are still still pretty close friends, but they start drifting apart. I don't not I do not know if Spear is becoming jealous of Chamberlain's fame. I mean, Chamberlain's been governor. He's a Bowdoin College professor and president. He is, he has outstanding name recognition in Maine, New England, at least among surviving Army the Potomac officers. Spear does not have that same name recognition. And it is also my opinion that he honestly disagreed with some of Chamberlain's memoirs. This would suggest that perhaps Chamberlain did embellish certain elements, perhaps of um, Fredericksburg and Gettysburg. Those are two accounts that Spear uh, disputed in print. Unfortunately for Spear in the, what, in the uh, disputing that he made about Fredericks, um, Clint Chamberlain's claims about Fredericksburg, Chamberlain, wrote a letter home to Brunswick, or at least a, a good friend in either Br uh, Brunswick or Portland after the battle. And the Portland Daily Press published that, basically describing the writer as anonymous not long after uh, the Union Army had withdrawn from Fredericksburg. Much of what is written in that letter, which you can, by process of elimination, you can only attribute to one or two officers. Right. Backs up what Chamberlain said happened up on Marie's Heights, not only during the initial assault, but in the two days and one full night, or two nights, excuse me, and one full day afterwards. Yeah, I know that that's a, you know, a particular source of tension among historians here in Fredericksburg. Yes. 
what what did Chamberlain do? Was he uh, on the field? Did he stay back? Did he stack up bodies? Didn't he? Um, and, and and that all comes back to these uh, varying accounts from Spear. Mm -hmm. The um, I find as a historian the details that Chamberlain includes in his Fredericksburg account. You've got the wind is catching that. Um, was the window blind or window shutter banging it through that Saturday night. He, see, he describes the Aurora Borealis. That's confirmed by other soldiers' accounts. They were laying on the field that night. It's very rare to see the Aurora Borealis that far south in Virginia. I've only seen it once in my entire life here in Maine. The um, I don't not come across evidence suggesting that in his writings about Fredericksburg shortly afterwards that Chamberlain embellished what he did. He was a writer. He thought differently than these other officers who was as heroic in different battles, including Gettysburg, were not writers. There is a difference between a businessman who goes off and fights in a war. He's going to come home and return to his business, maybe share some thoughts and letters, or let's say a college professor, particularly of rhetoric, when he comes home, He's going to start writing because writing is part of what he teaches. It's part of who he is. Now, I've intentionally kept us away from the, the highlights or the, the, the meat of the book, which is his actual Civil War service. Yeah. But uh, maybe you could give us a couple bullet points because I'm sure, you know, people know who Chamberlain is. I'm sure they know about Little Round Top, but we've alluded to um, Fredericksburg. We've alluded to Petersburg. Uh, we haven't even mentioned Appomattox. If, if you were to just give folks a couple of bullet points of his Civil War service, and then we'll point them to the book to flesh those out, um, what bullet points would you offer? First bullet point, Joshua Chamberlain and his borrowed horse acting as a navigational boy in the Potomac River during the Union withdrawal from Shepherdstown in September 1862. The second would be Chamberlain insisting that the smallpox quarantine 20th Maine be put into action at Chancellorsville, even as he said, as a paraphrase, if we do nothing more than give the Confederates smallpox. At the Battle of Rappahannock Station, did Chamberlain go in with a charge or didn't he? I say he did, but I can't prove it, but there is an incident that suggests he must have. At Petersburg, his questioning the order delivered to charge the Confederate lines from the hill that his troops had just captured. His, during the opening days of the Appomattox campaign, his immediate dislike of Phil Sheridan and his black horse and the weird flag that serves as, as Sheridan's, I guess, marker flag, whatever you would call it. The um, moment when he realizes that the Confederate riding towards him carrying a, what he calls a white towel tied to a staff or something at the Morris Courthouse on April 9th, 1865. Chamberlain's shock that where could they find a, a clean towel in the Confederate army? And then his the last bullet point would be his uh, emotional participation in the Grand Review. It's, I mean, and there are so many great stories. And, and one of the things I really like about the book is that it doesn't focus on the Little Round Top, which of course is a compelling story. But I mean, Chamberlain's got this great career that you really flesh out in some pretty good ways. And uh, of course, your own experience as a newspaper writer and editor, uh, you know how to tell a good story. So you, yeah. you really do justice to those bullet points. Um, as you look over those incidents, uh, any one thing stand out for you as, as a story that you particularly like or you wish people paid more attention to? Yes. I believe that uh, Chamberlain's finest offensive action was the Battle of Lewis Farm. Oh, he's taking his brigade up the Quaker Road, collides with the, at, at the farm with the Confederates coming south out of their trenches to find him. The battling battle seesaws back and forth 
And when the 185th New York gets into trouble on this left flank, Chamberlain rides in the midst of them, stays on his horse. The combat is swirling around him. Of course, Charles Griffin has promised that you can hold for 10 minutes, I'll send up an artillery battery. And Chamberlain is there. He's yelling, you know, hold for 10 minutes. And he does not go into detail though. Is he shooting? Is he hitting Confederates with a sword? Why hasn't he, hasn't he been, well, actually he would have been shot again because he was wounded probably a half hour earlier further south on the road when uh, the bullet punched through his Charlemagne's neck. But he's, there's 10, 15 minutes of intense combat there that Chamberlain really did not go into detail. And I would love to know more about exactly what happened, but it is, it seemed to be what they, uh, Duke of Wellington called a close run thing at, at Waterloo. Yeah. It seemed like it was very close. Now I had asked you to, to write this book for the series. So maybe this is a question for me rather than you, but because Chamberlain is so well known, why write a new biography about him? Chamberlain's well known almost solely for Little Round Top. Okay. <laughs> and growing up in Brewer, Maine in the 1960s, I was taught about Brewer Boy, Joshua Chamberlain, commanded the 20th Maine and won the Battle of Little Round Top and saved the Union Army and won the Civil War. <laughs> there is much more, hometown advantage, I guess. Yeah. There is much more to Chamberlain's service. The, the genesis of passing through the fire is that we focus almost exclusively on Chamberlain's wartime experiences, not just Little Round Top or Fredericksburg, but everything that came afterwards. He actually saw his greatest period of intense combat for three or four days of the opening of the, of the Appomattox campaign, where I'm surprised he was not shot down and killed in action. It just, it rounds out Chamberlain's military career and helps you understand more his uh, innate ability or inherent ability, I should say, as a leader, as a warrior. Uh, he was much more than just a scholar and a family man. I mean, he was, when he offered his services to the main governor in midsummer 1862, Chamberlain was maligned by other Bowdoin College faculty members and by the main attorney general. They said he would amount to nothing. Well, who remembers any of them? And today, <laughs> Joshua Chamberlain is a household word, at least in the Civil War world. Yeah. Well, and I think thanks to Ken Burns, um, he's one of the household names. If anybody knows anything about the Civil War, they know Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's name. We can credit, and Ryan Quint provides an excellent appendix about this, why Chamberlain issue but we can credit Michael Shera and Ken Burns for lifting Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain from obscurity to his modern fame. And so one reason that, that I thought you'd be great uh, to write this book, aside from your writing talent, which I've always admired, well, um, is just you, you write a blog called Maine at War. And I want to talk about that for just a second, because um, your work on that blog really has, has just immersed you in not only the time period, but the people, the personalities, the sources. And so I knew you would just have a great context from which to draw to pull this book together. Uh, tell me about Maine at War and, and what it is and, and what you do there. Mean of War started as a monthly column in the Bangor Daily News, for which I work in April 2011. And I continued that column until I retired three years later. Uh, I transitioned also to a weekly blog in March 2012, and it's still going strong. I cannot seem to run out of topics about which to write. But it has introduced me to so many people, not just Mainers, although they're the primary focus of the blog, but the people, I guess we call them out-of-staters here in Maine, that um, are from, they're people from away. People from that, away. Yeah. People from away. It's another Maine term for anybody who's listening. Uh, it's friendly. It's not a mean term. Um, it uh, introduces you to the 
people with which Mainers came into contact. And there's so many. I mean, just in researching the Chamberlain book, I have met and become, I uh, use quotation marks, acquainted with so many colonels, generals, and regiments with which Chamberlain came into contact or he, you know, he was friends with or served with. It has helped me to incredibly expand my knowledge about the Civil War, but to my dying day, I'll still be learning. I think all historians have, must feel that way. Mm -hmm. I was during that, uh, the Civil War encampment at Fort Knox on Saturday, I had the opportunity to go onto the parade ground and photograph some of the reenactors doing the drills. And they uh, did the drill there about with involving the bayonet. I, and I learned that the soldiers drew their bayonet with their left hand, not their right one, supposedly. Mm -hmm. I've got to confirm that, but that's what it, how it was done. So I'm, I'm always still learning. <laughs> and, and there are so many great units and regiments and, and personalities and people, you oh. know. Um, so, you know, the story of Maine certainly goes well beyond the 20th Maine, even though that's what uh, most people recognize. But uh, I mean, just a rich, rich Civil War history. Yeah, um, it's an incredible history. And of course, we had the one, I call it three incidents involving Civil War on Maine soil, a big one being the Confederate sailors stealing the revenue cutter out of Portland Harbor. They got caught. There was a bank robbery in Callis in far eastern Maine. And then there was a Lisa reconnaissance at night on Fort Madison in Castine. And the uh, senior NCO in charge of the small garrison got shot mm -hmm. and wounded. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever was able to figure out who came ashore and probed the fort. See, it sounds like there should be a Maine at War book. Oh, wait, there is. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've published, um, planning to publish, I should say, a three-part series titled Maine at War. Uh, Maine at War, Volume 1, titled Bladensburg to Sharpsburg, was published in 2019. It covers Maine's involvement in the first 18 months of the war, as told through the eyes of Maine men and women who served. I'm not just focusing on soldiers, but politicians, civilians. I have met, much to my delight, many Maine nurses, uh, women who volunteered to leave home and care for the wounded, initially from Maine, but in time from anywhere in the Union States and after Gettysburg, even Confederates uh, who are wounded or sick. I'm currently wrapping up volume two in terms of the writing. I have one chapter to finish on Gettysburg, which is a long section. <laughs> and then uh, volume three, I've written some of that. But right now, my goal is to finish up volume two and start working on that with the publisher. And I'll remind listeners that we feature Brian's work, Main at War, uh, with a monthly post that highlights the previous month's work that he has done at his, at his own blog. And I want to encourage folks to go and read those stories because uh, just some great, great human interest stuff that Brian is able to share every month uh, as he's delving into the archives and letters and, and stories. Of these Thank stories. you. Yeah, yeah, wonderful stuff. So Brian, before we wrap up, any final thoughts on Colonel Chamberlain that you'd want to share with folks? Chamberlain was the quintessential volunteer soldier, civilian soldier, in both sides, from every state, from the territories, men who were civilians at heart, and would always be civilians at heart, volunteered to don a uniform, learn the art of soldiering, and then went out to whatever fate awaited them. Most were like Chamberlain. They became good soldiers, uh, loyal to their causes. Some were scoundrels, obviously. Some became deserters. Some became turncoats. I mean, there were many Mainers who fought for the South. Usually it seemed to involve the love for a Southern lady, but I can understand well, that. Love will make you do weird things. Yeah. But he was, to me, he was the uh, quintessential civilian soldier that Fantastic. was willing to hang up his uniform once the fighting ended and re returned to his civilian life. 
The book is called Passing Through the Fire, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain in the Civil War. The author, Brian Swartz, author also of the blog, Maine at War. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, glad to have you with us. I'm Chris Mikowski for Emerging Civil War. Thanks for being with us today. We will see you online and on the battlefield.